Well, it looks like we're going to be here for a while. Okay. Yeah, we'll just we're we're staying here. What did they say? They did say when they come, give them hell. All right. Here they come. Shoot faster! Ugh. What? Well, what do you want me to do? Shoot 30 rounds a minute or some craziness? Yeah. Although we have already established that the British Army, or more pointedly, the infantry and cavalry, shot a maximum of 15 rounds as part of Practice 22, and that this must necessarily satisfy the definition of the Mad Minute, as it pertains to the soldiery at large. We must also examine, however, the other way in which to define the term, to put each in the proper context in relation to each other. The Mad Minute as a feat of arms. Commonly, there is an association between the musketry as practiced by the army at large and the so-called world record. Most often this comes in the form of the incorrect statement that British soldiers could fire more than 15 rounds per minute. Now of course, some may very well have been able to do that, but on an annual basis they certainly had no capability in which to prove it, being only allotted 15 rounds in Practice 22. The source of this highly propagated but completely misunderstood association is a passage in Ian Hogg's Encyclopedia of Weaponry. In it, he states the following. The Mad Minute was a term used by British riflemen during training to describe scoring 15 hits onto a target at 300 yards within one minute using a bolt-action rifle. It was not uncommon during the First World War for riflemen to greatly exceed this score. Many riflemen could average 30-plus shots, while the record, set in 1914 by Sergeant Alfred Snoxall, was 38. Now this passage itself is a reference to yet another work, Pridham's Superiority of Fire, specifically a footnote on page 57, which states, Sergeant Major Wallingford's original height record of 36 rounds in 60 seconds with the SMLE rifle stood until about 1914, when Sergeant Instructor Snoxall fired 38 rounds in one minute at 300 yards with all his shots in the inner ring. This probably stands as a world's record for a hand-loaded rifle. In each case, the target used was a four-foot figure target with a 12-inch figure five. The lower half of the target was covered green or brown, the upper half gray or green. The bullseye figure was colored brown. So, let's take this all in. First, Hogg confuses things by mentioning an abbreviated and vague version of what is most certainly Practice 22, in the same context as a claim that many soldiers could shoot more or even upwards of 30 rounds in the same time frame. He finishes this association with mention of Sergeant Knoxall achieving 38. As mentioned, these two activities, Practice 22 and the standalone demonstration, are two separate and distinct activities. Hogg makes it sound like Practice 22 was an all-out effort to shoot as many rounds as possible. By this association, he also insinuates that all soldiers had the opportunity and that many could make good on 30 or more. Riflemen during the First World War were not the riflemen that marched to it in 1914. In fact, once the new armies came to the field, musketry proficiency was a constant struggle. What once was a long, drawn-out, peacetime activity with plenty of opportunity to practice and train, from 1914 became a hurried, abbreviated affair. Training massed armies required economies that did not allow for fine-tuning and comprehensive instruction. That said, as I perused a musketry manual from 1916, I was struck by the similarities in the annual qualification from that wartime year. It is virtually unchanged. With only a slight modification to Part 3, the classification practices, made by the addition of an extra five-round rapid at 200 yards and the omission of the 500-yard rapid shoot as found in the 1914 version. Incidentally, this results in a slightly altered numbering system. The old Practice 22 of 1914 is now renumbered Practice 23. This is the same in the 1915 manual. It's important to note, however, that the standard here and as referred to in previous videos is that for the regular army the Territorial Army, 
and the new army had different and inferior standards. But this is the subject for another video. The reference in Pridham is also not understood completely. Although it does a great deal for continued understanding of the subject without previous knowledge, it is easy to see how details might be and have been misinterpreted. At the time of production of this video, I don't have a primary source that may point to a modification of the musketry regulations for wartime expediency, but anecdotal evidence certainly does support the thought that musketry training during the war was abridged or modified to a degree. So that is the root of the confusion and misunderstanding. Now we'll clarify some of the details that make up these feats of arms. The men of the Mad Minute. One man is, in the popular version of events, credited with scoring 38 hits. His name was Alfred Snoxall. As a sergeant instructor of musketry at the musketry school in Hythe, he and his colleagues were in a unique position within the army. They trained the trainers, the regimental instructors who would teach musketry back at their battalions. As permanent staff at the school, these individuals occupied the apex of the pyramid of army musketry. They alone would have the time, resources, and a reason to practice and attain these incredible rates of fire. The validity of Snoxall as a man is somewhat suspect, as there are no records and no photographs in either civil or military records. The only reference to him is in the Pridham volume. A possible explanation is that his was one of the thousands of records that were destroyed in bombing raids during World War II. The only other supporting reference to his existence I have found is this enigmatic post on a popular forum. It claims that Snoxall was named in a book written by the second-in-command of the musketry school in 1922. In reality, whether he existed or not doesn't necessarily disprove the concept of inflated rates of fire, as we shall see. Another man, Jesse Wallingford, mentioned in the reference, certainly did exist and had many international shooting accolades to his credit, including an Olympic bronze medal. He is credited with a score of 36 hits. If he did that, could someone else have squeezed in two more? Not beyond the realm of possibility, I think. Now, why did these men attempt these feats of shooting? The wording of the reference would have it that it was some sort of competition. This is not the case. Wallingford's feat in particular comes earlier in 1908, conspicuously on the eve of the adoption of the new musketry program of 1909. As discussed in part one of this series, the new program was universally regarded as many times more difficult than the immediate post-war version of 1905. This clearly points to the fact that these standalone feats were demonstrations, not competitions designed to place confidence in the fact that this new standard of 15 rounds was reachable. This view is also shared, incidentally, by a certain YouTube celebrity. Snoxall's effort, if it actually happened, would simply have been another such demonstration, showing the ultimate in rapid fire. These activities were not the preserve of the army at large, however. There simply wasn't the ammunition to allot for the many thousands of soldiers spread around the globe to sit at the range next to a huge pile of ammunition with which to practice. Now, the instructors at Hythe? Well, there is a much better chance that they were able to do so. Prowess in musketry was also not just the preserve of those at Hythe. Inflated rates of fire were also demonstrated about the Empire. I might draw your attention to some of these examples found in Australian newspapers of rapid shooting demonstrations. From 1915, and 1916. They purport the shooting of even higher numbers of rounds, 40, 41 indeed, seemingly under the same level of demonstration conditions as was encountered at Hive. Pretty incredible shooting. Although covered in the first segment on Practice 22, the targetry claimed to be used for these demonstrations is also often muddled and incorrect. For the same reasons as before, it was very clearly a second-class figure target and not a 12-inch bull or any other type. Now that we have waded through the fuzzy myths and half-truths of legend and internet regurgitation, we can deal with some key shooting aspects that were likely observed during rapid-fire demonstrations. B-52 
because of the nature of the exercise, there would seem to be a case for the use of certain techniques and practices that were not necessarily in line with standard musketry practices and training. Here, we'll explore some of these. These demonstrations were not demonstrations of how well one could do at Practice 22. They were flat-out rate-of-fire extravaganzas, albeit them in the guise of army shooting. To me, the concept that forms somewhat of a gateway towards deviation from normal practices is the issue of ammunition placement. A minor point to be considered is the preparation of the chargers. Often, issued chargers can be stiff and the finish rough inside. This can lead to binding and jamming when loading. By running an emery cloth through the inside, they are buffed down and become very slick indeed. Certainly, this would have been done for any firepower demonstration. In practice 22, and all rapid practices for that matter, ammunition was strictly instructed to be placed in the pouch. I don't for a second believe that 36 or 38 rounds were fired while fishing each individual charger from the webbing or bandolier. The ammunition was most certainly placed in a convenient spot for instant access. So, if this key deviation could be made for the sake of time, and more than likely it was, then why not others? Trigger and bolt manipulation may also have played a role. Typically, rapid fire was exercised using a conventional technique, no other being necessary to achieve the standard of 15 rounds a minute. Solid drills and a familiarity was all that was required. You can see here in this demonstration how the bolt is placed next to the trigger so that the hand does not have to move very far to grasp it. Likewise, after the round is chambered, the hand is placed immediately by the trigger, ready for the next shot. There remains the question of other techniques. Palming is one such that is mentioned in speculation. To me, this is the least efficient method available, as with it, the hand must move the most, and the fingers are not as close to the wrist and trigger as with other methods. The technique that is perhaps most associated with the Mad Minute, or rapid firing with the SMLE in general, is one whereby the bolt is grasped with the thumb and the index finger, while the trigger is pressed with the middle. Not surprisingly, there is no mention of such a technique in contemporary documentation. However, it is mentioned specifically in texts from the Second World War. Had the instructors at Hythe or other discerning regimental instructors stumbled across something that would later become a bona fide practice? Perhaps. The use of this technique does indeed speed things up, although without having the hand on the wrist, accuracy can suffer. The fire position used was probably not the prone. There was only one other position that combines the stability of the prone with the ease of use of other positions. Shooting from a breastwork or trench, especially one that is of the correct dimensions, is much easier than shooting from the prone. It affords good, stable foot placement. The chest and ribs can be braced against the wall. The elbows are able to be anchored in place, and the forestock and hand can be rested and secured on the parapet with sandbags. This, combined with the overall more comfortable standing position, makes for a superior position for shooting and, as importantly, loading. This all makes for faster shooting. Here we see a demonstration of rapid fire from the 1950s. Note the well-supported position, his bolt and trigger technique, and the fact that he's reloading and shooting five at a time. This brings us to the next aspect. To use modern language, how was the rifle run? Firstly, the demonstration undoubtedly began with 11 rounds in the weapon, 10 in the magazine and 1 in the chamber. As for shooting, in the past I have used a few different techniques. I have used a Fire 11 Load 10 scheme, and I have tried Fire 6 Load 5. In my latest effort, I have tried a more conventional Fire 11 and Load 5. What was used for the historical demonstration we will never know, but undoubtedly it was something that the firer was intimately familiar with. The use of a sling also warrants consideration. 
although it was not allowed for range practices and general use was discouraged, there might be a case for its use. After all, pre-placed ammunition and shooting from a trench were also not part of normal rapid practices. In actuality, it provides only a small benefit in the trench or breastwork position, but one nonetheless. Now, all these are compromises to the musketry regulations. In one way or another, the use of all of them would certainly gain the firer the best advantage, while still remaining militarily conceivable. So there you have it. We are now ready for a run at 38 rounds without the constraints of the minutiae of the musketry regulations. Still, however, well within the realm of military shooting, of course. The subject of the Mad Minute as a competition should be addressed. We have already determined that the unlimited rapid fire of Wallingford and Snoxall, amongst others, were demonstrations, but we should examine what competitions were like so as to place rapid fire in the proper context within these activities. Competitions were widespread across the army, at regimental, regional, and army level. In the examples I found, there was indeed mention of specifically rapid shoots as part of these competitions, or at least an implied requirement. The most rounds used in any was 10, hardly the free run that the myth would have you believe. I encourage you to rewind and read the details of these competitions. They sound like good fun and militarily applicable. Perhaps the biggest caveat that needs to be addressed is the issue of accuracy. I was able to put all but three rounds in the inner ring during my effort in Practice 22. Just to put this in perspective, in the account of the 38 round demonstration of 1914, all 38 rounds were within this ring. That's over twice the rate of fire with perfect accuracy. Perfect in the sense that for Practice 22, the inner ring and the figure therein scored three points. This is spectacular shooting, and I personally am not near that standard at all when the rate of fire rises to fever pitch. As we'll see in my effort in unlimited shooting, I shot at 100 yards, and my target looked like this. Accurate, but not too consistent, and if this would be extrapolated to 300 yards, the group of course would be much larger and perhaps contain some misses. Now, could somebody who was well practiced and professional achieve a group inside the inner ring? Having seen some experts at work, and given the right conditions, I'd say so. This speaks to the balance between rate and accuracy that was previously mentioned. So we've discussed all the relevant details of what the rapid fire demonstrations may have looked like and touched briefly on the fact that they weren't part of any competition. Before we crack on with some of our own attempts at rapid fire, we'll examine an underlying concept that should be addressed. As discussed earlier, these demonstrations were not just of rapid fire for the sake of rapid fire. They were shot at targets with the intent to hit and score well. This concept marks these efforts squarely with a military shooting stamp. That is, shooting rapidly to hit, not just blazing away. At all times, as we have seen in the many range practices of the annual qualification and in our examination of rapid fire demonstrations, hitting what you were aiming at was the primary objective, even if it came at a reduced rate of fire. There will always be a relationship between accuracy and the rate that is inversely proportional. For every given shooter, the faster they fire, the less accurate they will be. Striking the balance is the key. To illustrate this, I set up a small comparison. Five 8-inch targets at 100 yards. In the first try, I fired at a rate that I was confident I would hit every time. As you can see, it was rapid enough, and I hit all the targets the first try. The last one was actually hit, but didn't fall due to its wooden construction. In the second attempt, I tried to shoot faster, and resultingly, I didn't hit at near the same rate as in the first practice. Again, this was just to emphasize that any rapid shooting, whether it was during a formal range practice, or as part of a demonstration, or indeed when used against the enemy, were always executed with the intent to hit the target.
This brings us to my latest effort in unlimited rapid fire. I am by no means an expert, but I tried my best and focused on competent drills and according to the discussion had in the course of this video, I availed myself of the demonstrated techniques and procedures that may have been used. For this shoot, I used a parapet bench, a design to simulate shooting from a trench or breastwork. It's used in a standing position, and a sandbag is positioned on the shelf at the front edge for resting the hand and forestock. I charged the magazine with 10 rounds, put one up the spout, and settled in to try to better my last effort, which was just shy of 30 rounds. As you can see, I shot the 30th round at 60 seconds and the 31st at 61.2. Personally, I was happy with that result. I have been using well-used brass for most of my SMLE shooting, and some cases have become quite tight in the chamber, leading to the odd hard extraction. I wonder if the absence of these small hiccups would have enabled me to load and fire another five. After reviewing the footage, I don't think so perhaps 31 rounds, but not a complete reload. To achieve this, my overall rate of fire would have to increase considerably to match Wallingford's 36 or Snoxall's 38. By the winter of 1914, the British army that had marched into Belgium in August, known ever after as the Old Contemptibles, had effectively ceased to exist. Reservists replaced casualties and the remainder of the regular army was recalled from across the empire. These new divisions were thrown into the fray. Empire troops from India, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa all took their turn fighting for the cause. The Territorial Army and Kitchener's new armies would eventually take their place in the line as well. Never again would the man and his rifle be so dominant as it had been in the opening months of the war. Industrial warfare would take hold, and the greatest cataclysm man had yet seen would reduce the soldier and his rifle to an accessory of the vast panoply of weaponry that would eventually be fielded. But in 1914, the Tommy, the Jock, the Mick or the Taft with his SMLE were what mattered. For those of you interested in further research on the subject of musketry in the British Army of 1914, I invite you to have a look at the following papers available at the links provided. Shooting Power by Dr. Spencer Jones. The Influence of the Boer War on the Tactical Development of the British Army, also by Spencer Jones. And From Drill to Doctrine by Nick Evans. I found all of these exceptionally interesting. So this brings us to the end of the Musketry of 1914 series, eight parts in all. I do sincerely hope that you have enjoyed it. I did my best to make a series that would be the best on the topic in this medium. I hope that the series will prove valuable to shooters, whether you be historical or otherwise, history buffs or indeed professionals, reenactors and living history practitioners. But above all, I hope it does justice to the memory of those who took this training with them across the channel in those heady days of August 1914 and never return.
If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below.